or six musicians who can all sing. Uh, Simon Townsend, uh, so there's Pete and Roger, Simon, and then John Corey, Lauren Gold, and, uh, and myself. And so that's the six parts can be handled by the whole band. Amazing. And mm -hmm. when you, uh, the, the last tour you did was Quadrophenia. I don't know if it was when you worked with Roger and did Tommy, or was it with Quadrophenia, where you ended up like with 230 some mixes of remixes oh, of the oh, songs? Yeah. That's right. Um, when we go through these songs, sometimes we want to change the key, we want to slow it down, speed it up, you know, change parts. Songs evolve in terms of arrangement, and I have to accommodate that. And so, um, and then I had to make mixes that emphasize certain instruments, like the horns, the trumpets, the trombones, the, the background vocals, the keyboard parts. And that's why I made so many mixes, because there were, you know, for the Quadrophenia tour, we probably had 35, 40 songs, and it's easy to have three, 236 mixes or however many I made. But um, yeah, I, I made those from, um, of course, they entrusted me with the multi tracks, which is amazing. I have sure. the multi track to Tommy wow. and Quadrophenia in my studio. And, and you were, <clears throat> this even pushed you to have to learn certain brass instruments. That's oh, this well, undertaking. I, I, I had to learn. Uh, uh, you know, I, I've taken music theory and part of my uh, work was to know the ranges of instruments and I, I wrote out five-part brass parts. Yeah, I had to know their ranges. Wow. For trumpet, there was usually, on quadrophenia, there's trumpet one, two, three, trombone and euphonium. Wow. And, and in the past, the keyboards took over that or since used to sample right, those sounds? Right, right. Um, when we did quadrophenia, I would back the real horn players with my sample uh, triggered samples which the the very players we played with uh, helped me produce nice and one thing with the who they were the very one of the very first bands to use uh triggering or uh, live uh, stuff uh, tracks on the live right uh, uh there were as a matter of fact pete townsend invented playing to audio tracks which is uh, something that a lot of bands do now which means to play to existing tracks, and now we have digital means of reproducing it. In the early days, he actually brought a 24-track analog machine, which I heard was a nightmare. I'm sure he got, you know, pissed off at a 24-track uh, analog machine, put his uh, SG into it or something, or his Les Paul into it, you know. So going full circle, they're actually, you've taken them out of, they've really minimized that live. Uh, well, um, the, the harmonies are live, um, but a lot of the songs that the Who play, including, of course, Won't Get Fooled Again, Bob O'Reilly, Who Are You, Join Together, these songs require audio tracks. They are inherently part of the song. So Almost as an instrument. Right. It's just another, you know, uh, it's part of the sound of the song. And so... Um, and an integral part of the song. So it's no surprise that you would use an audio track. Sure, that. sure. I mean, you can't conceive of playing, won't get fooled again unless you play an acoustic version of it without those audio tracks that we're so familiar with. Right, right, it would sound be lacking. Mm -hmm. In March, you embark on a world tour for the 50, the Who Turns 50. Right. You've got a month of preparing. Uh, what What's gonna happen this, we're, we're brand new months, what's gonna happen before you leave? Well, I'm I have, I'm working on a musical right now called uh, Sex Rated G, and it's really funny as a, a comedy. And um, and I'm also still making progress with uh, my, our first musical, which is called The Door, uh, which is a satire about the music business uh, and a love story and a coming of age story, all interwoven. So I'm working on those two musicals. Occasionally I'll get a call from my agent who brings me uh, commercial work. As I said, I did a com um, Colgate commercial. I went to the NAMM show. I, I've uh, playing some local gigs because there's nothing therapeutic, more therapeutic than playing music, as you probably know. Yes. Right. It's the most, uh, you know, soul cleansing and uh, spiritually uplifting thing you can do. I'm actually writing a book about achieving nirvana through music and um, movement. Wow. I, I, I just don't think it's very, it's, it's a simple uh, method 
of achieving a, a, a fantastic uh, meditative state where you feel at one with the universe. I, I, I don't think it's uh, you don't have to spend your whole life breathing and doing nothing, you know, sitting down. You can achieve it if you, it's just a, a matter of achieving a level of focus. Sure. So I'm writing about that. Nice. So I'm that's another thing I'm doing. And then the tour starts in March and I'm working on that. Now, you know, usually uh, I've, I've had the privilege of meeting a lot of people, a lot of musicians, a lot of artists. They're usually, you know, the right brain, left brain. You are such an anomaly because <laughs> you are seriously a scholar and extremely creative. That is an anomaly. I have never found that before. Hmm. Well, since I was a kid, I think my grandpa, uh, he was a chemist and he taught me a lot about the universe, about the air, you know, the air's composition, about astronomy, uh, all sorts of things, about atomic particles, all these different things. And um, he uh, showed me the love of learning. And boy, if there's anything you can teach a child is that. 